Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, who's ready for Songfest week one? Yeah. All right, lean in. Good morning, church. Have you heard that one before? I give it up one more time for Sam and all the musicians and singers. <laughs> How many of you know we're blessed to have a, a team of talented artists, musicians, and singers? And uh, live music is cool. We love live music in the summer, and that's a little bit about what Song Fest is about. There is a parallel uh, in God's word of this song, Landside, and that's what we're going to take a look at today. It's found in the book of Ruth. Ruth, uh, we're about to read, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of context before we jump into the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth is this small book in the Bible. It's only four chapters. It's in between Judges and 1 Samuel, and it's this pivotal, crucial turning point for God's people uh, in Israel. So what is happening is at the end of Judges, it says four times, all the people did what they wanted in their own eyes. They did as they saw fit in their own eyes, and there was no king. It's almost like crying out desperately, like we need a king. There's lawlessness. And what's also interesting about this is that this is in the promised land. Much of the beginning of the Old Testament is about God's people trying to get out of slavery into the promised land. In the book of Ruth, they're in the promised land. And what we find in the promised land is not all peace and prosperity um, and pleasure. It's actually a lot of lawlessness and chaos and disorder. 
Uh, God's people actually brought chaos with them into the promised land. And uh, Ruth is this juncture point. But as we see in the book of Ruth, we also see God's beautiful story of redemption and how God is always working. And you can actually see the Bible, the the, the arc of redemption that God is working in humanity. You see the whole story uh, in these four chapters. So uh, will you turn with me to the book of Ruth chapter one? And we are God's people uh, relying and looking to the word of God. So we're gonna read the whole chapter together. Ruth chapter one. You can follow along on the screen. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah left his home and went to the, live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people would be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them arrived, uh, so the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer? The Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me. So Naomi returned home from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. Lord, we, we don't typically show up to places like this out of religious obligation or ritual. Lord, we're here because we believe in you or we need to believe in you. We're fighting to believe in you. And the reality is, Lord, that we live in a society and an an earth that is broken and there is a lot of pain and suffering. And some of us, we, we we need a breakthrough from you. So spirit of the living God, would you touch us? Would you speak to us? Because we need you. We want to know you more and we want to live by your power and promises. Thank you, Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, amen. I I think the first thing that we see from both Ruth chapter one and from Landslide is that trouble will come. Trouble is going to come. You cannot escape it. You cannot avoid it. A reality of life is that trouble will come. Stevie Nicks wrote the song Landslide when she was in Aspen, Colorado. Um, She was looking up at the Rocky Mountains when she penned this song Landslide. In a previous season of life, Stevie Nicks had been a waitress and she was scraping by, living in poverty, waiting tables during the day, writing music at night, just trying to catch her break as an aspiring artist, wanting to play music, wanting to sing and and write and, and, and play concerts. 
And she meets Lindsay Buckingham and they fall in love and they start a duo and they have a lot of success when they join with Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac says, Lindsay Buckingham, hey, we want you to come play guitar for us. And he says, hey, I will come join if Stevie can come with me too. So Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, they join Fleetwood Mac and they kind of take off like a rocket with a lot of success. And uh, they're playing these sell out, sold out shows and uh, she obviously has more success than she even dreamed of and more money than she dreamed of. And she's living this kind of, this dream that she always hoped for and wished for. And then her relationship with Lindsay starts to deteriorate. And as you know, the, your dreams aren't always what they're cracked up to be. And her life seems to be crumbling and falling apart. And she feels stuck in a relationship, stuck in a group. And she's not really sure how to move forward as times are changing. And she pens this iconic song, Landslide, talking about how everything seems to be crumbling around her. And she's not sure what to do, how to move forward with all the pieces that seem to be falling apart. She knows the same thing that Ruth knows, that trouble will come. See, in Ruth chapter one, it throws us into the action right away. It says, in the time of the judges, there was a famine. Uh, It says that, again, God's people are in the promised land. They're in Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? Bethlehem literally means house of bread. So they're in the promised land, living in the house of bread, and there is no food. And so they're forced to leave. They gotta go somewhere else. They have to migrate, and they go to Moab. Now, in antiquity, uh, um, Moab would be like a modern day Jew going to live in Gaza. It's like Moab, like what? No, Moab, I don't wanna, like what? Moab, really? There was such vitriol between the two groups, the Moabites and God's people, the Israelites. But because there's no food, they are forced to, to leave. So Naomi, which means sweetness, and her husband Eli, uh, Elimelech, which means my God is king, they're forced to leave the house of bread and go live in Moab. Things are not going the way her life was supposed to go. Once they get to Moab, however, they they settle down and her her boys grow up and they marry good girls and things start to be going good until what? Her husband dies and then her boys die and well, it went from worse to maybe okay to now just everything comes crashing down because the prospects for a widow living in a foreign land with no male in the household Naomi knows her life is pretty much over. And she's thinking, wow, this is definitely not what I signed up for. My name is Sweetness. There was supposed to be joy and life and happiness and everything has fallen apart. All of her hopes, all of her dreams, all of her desires, all of her family, it's all fallen apart because Ruth learned this lesson that in this earth, in this life, trouble is, is going to come. You can't, you can't avoid it. Now, the reality is in many Christian circles, they work very hard to ignore this reality. You can find people of faith who well-intentioned, but they will project this version of Christianity where no bad things ever happen. Where if you do the right things, if you follow the right rules, if you have the right morality and take the right next steps, then nothing bad is ever gonna happen. God is gonna bless you and you're always gonna have money in the bank, and you're always gonna be healthy, and there's never gonna be sickness, and there's never gonna be relational conflict, and everything's always gonna work out just the way it should. The problem is that's not what scripture tells us. And when we have this version of Christianity that some people believe in and buy into, and then it doesn't match up with reality, it creates a very powerful distortion in our mind that leads us to wrestle with, What do I even know about God? Because what I thought about God doesn't seem real. And not only that, is there something wrong with me? Because it doesn't seem like life is working out for me the way it's supposed to work out for me. And it leads us wrestling with questions that are tough to to grapple with and tough to find solid answers to. The old pastor, Frederick uh, Buechner said it like this. He said, here in this world, beautiful and terrible things will happen. The orphan Annie and the rapper JC said it like this. They said, it's a hard knock life for us. And if you don't believe the orphan Annie or the rapper Jay-Z, Jesus said it like this. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Trouble's unavoidable. It's going to 
to come. And what's tempting for all of us is we kind of think, well, once I figure this out, once I resolve this issue, once I finally get ahead, once I make it past this barrier, then I'm gonna make it. The problem is um, once you get to that new season, there's, a, there's more trouble. It's this uh, elusive, like, there's no such thing as a carefree, trouble-free life. But yeah, so many people, we still chase it as if, it, as if it's gonna be there. And I, and I, and I hate to, to pop your bubble this morning, but it's a reality. On this side of heaven, now here's the truth. One day Jesus is gonna come back and Jesus is gonna come back to judge the living and the dead. And the first thing scripture tells us he's gonna do is he's gonna wipe every tear from every eye. And that'll be day one, moment one of everything working out. That's a beautiful day that we can all look forward to and have hope in. But until that moment, there's gonna be trouble. So Ruth and, or sorry, Naomi and uh, Elimelech, they they go to Moab and their two sons, Malon and Kilion, you know what their names mean? We don't know and we don't care. (laughs) Just trying to bring a little humor to a heavy message. They die and it leads Ruth to this place of where do I go from here? And my first point is troubles are gonna come. My, my, my second point is we're invited to speak freely about how much it hurts. We are invited. You are invited, you are encouraged, according to scripture, to speak freely about how much it hurts. When trouble comes your way, when the pain seems to be crushing you and you're, you can't figure it out and you don't know how to move forward, scripture invites you to speak freely about how much it hurts and how you feel. I'll show you from the story. If we go to verse 20, the the people of Bethlehem are excited. Naomi's coming back. They say, hey, is this Naomi? Let's celebrate. Our friend Naomi is back. And Naomi corrects them. She says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me sweetness. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full. I had a good thing going, but the Lord, it's God's fault. The Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord, it's God's fault, has caused me to suffer and the Almighty, it's God's fault, has sent such tragedy upon me. Do you see the hurt in her words? Now, the amazing thing, there's an interesting thing going on with the Hebrew words that she uses here. She calls God four times, but she uses two different terms. God has different names. Uh, One name for God is El Shaddai, that's the Lord Almighty. Another name for God is Yahweh, the covenant name of God in a relationship covenant. And she says, she doesn't even say El Shaddai. She just, she doesn't say the Lord Almighty. She says Almighty, then she says Yahweh, and then she says Almighty again. She comes to view God from her life circumstances as God, he's not my Lord Almighty, he's just Almighty. He's just brute, powerful force that has crushed me. And you know what's crazy about scripture is it doesn't censor her. It doesn't say, hey, Nomi, you, you shouldn't talk like that. That's, that's kind of unfitting of God. No, it actually holds her words up and puts them in scripture as if to say, you're, you can be honest about how you feel. You can be honest about what it was like to lose your husband, to become a widow, to lose your sons. We're invited to to speak freely, and this isn't the the only place where we see it. You know, there are some Christian circles who ascribe, to, again, to a certain version of Christianity, and they say, you really gotta be careful about the words that come out of your mouth. You know, you don't wanna say anything negative. You don't wanna, you know, just, just be careful. And, and, and I'm all for declaring the promises of God, and I'm all for positive affirmations and daily affirmations. These are healthy, good things. But I'm not for swallowing and suppressing the truth because the truth is sometimes life is hard. And I wanna show you from scripture some examples of godly heroes of the faith that were freely expressing what they were going through. We could look no further than, than people like Moses and Elijah and Jonah. Moses said in Numbers eleven fifteen, if this is how you intend to treat me, God, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. Wow, there's a words of candor from Moses, a hero of the faith. What about Elijah in 1 Kings 19.4? Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. When life feels like it's crushing you, they cried out, they spoke out to God, and the Bible doesn't say, no, 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 you can't say that. You need to smile and, 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 and be happy. 
You need to be too blessed to be stressed and too anointed to be disappointed or disjointed. What about Jonah? Jonah chapter four, verse three. Jonah said, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. We can see the example of scripture when when it feels like all of your life has been burnt to ash, you can cry out to God and you can tell him exactly how you feel in that moment. Because if you, here's the alternative. If you just swallow the reality of the truth and you don't share and you don't express it, you know what that does? You cannot heal on the inside. But if you take that step to be candid, to be honest, to cry out to God and let him know the hell that you're going through, you know what the Almighty does in that moment? He draws near to you. You're invited to speak freely about the pain, about the anguish, about the hurt, about the disappointment, about the betrayal, about the brokenness. Um, I read to my girls at night. I got girls that are 10, 8, and 5, and I I read a book to them at night. And you know what I'll do a lot of of nights before or after I read the book? I will just linger in their room. I'll just sit down on their bed next to them, and I will just just linger, just listen. and, And you know why I do that? because I want my girls to share with me what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're going through. Sometimes kids, sometimes you'll have kids that they'll just come and share and they'll show every, everything with you. Other times you have kids, especially as they get a little bit older, like my oldest. So you know what I'll do? I will sit there on her bed and I will just let her know, hey, I'm, I'm not going anywhere right now. If you wanna share anything. Because I want my daughter to, to just share with me. Did you know your heavenly father? He's so much better. He wants you to share what you're going through, the reality, the hurt, the disappointment. Some of you, your relationship with God isn't growing. It's actually shriveling and dying because you're being too polite with God. And what you need to do is finally open up about the hurt, about the disappointment, about the bitterness. And because here's, God can handle it. God's not gonna look around and say, Jesus, did you know that? Here's the secret, God already knows He's not gonna be surprised. He just wants you to take the healthy step of bringing it to him because who can handle all of that bitterness and hurt and betrayal and loneliness and angst? God can handle it. But on yourself, if you stuff it on the inside, you can't, we can't, we break. Some of you have read the book of Job. If you haven't, it's this painful book to read. There's this this man, Job, that the, the Bible holds up is a very righteous man and his life falls apart and he's one point he has pottery and he's scraping boils off his arm and he says, the, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away, but the, the name of the Lord will be praised. And Job's friends hear him say this and this is the, the right thing to say and his friends, they're like, Job, you, you got it all wrong. This is what you need to do and you need to do this and if you would just take these steps, then you would get God's attention. If you would just do these things, then God would heal you and listen to you. And finally, after listening to his friends for a long time ramble on, Job has had enough. And Job unleashes some of the the strongest venom you will find in Scripture. It is full of bitterness. It is full of hurt. It is full of anguish. And Job just unleashes. And this is God's response to Job. After Job goes on this tirade, even saying that God is wicked, this is what God says to Job. Job 42, seven, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. Now God does correct Job, but he tells his friends, your friends, they got it all wrong. Job, you spoke to me honestly. You spoke to me correctly. I, you're allowed to bring all that to me. I can, I can handle it. Uh, if you grew up in the 90s and you listened to alternative music, you may have heard a band called Everclear. Everclear, and the lead singer, his name was uh, Art uh, Alexicus, and um, they had a song like Santa Monica, Father of Mine, Wonderful, a few of these songs you may have heard. Um, on one of their early albums, uh, he wrote a song called Why I Don't Believe in God. And he grew up in California, and when he was young, his dad left him. His dad abandoned him. And some of his songs, he writes about how his dad would send him a birthday card with a $5 bill. But his dad left, and in the song, Why I Don't Believe in God, he wrote about the pain of growing up without his father. And he was very candid. He's like, I, I, he's, he's like, I want to believe in a merciful God, but I don't because the pain that I went through. Because my dad wasn't there, and he became a drug addict in East L.A., living in poverty, living on the streets, and got hung up in drugs. And then he learned to play guitar and joined the, the group. So the lead singer of, of Everclear, 
he, um, he had a turning point in his life. And do you know when it was? It was when he met some Christians that were loving. He goes on to say, um, it was those born again Christians that loved me that changed my view about God. He puts his faith in God. Today, to this day, he's been sober for decades and he credits all to God. Oh, he still sings his songs. Um, not that he doesn't sing the, the song, Why I Don't Believe God Anymore, but he, he still sings the, the same Everclear songs. But there was, a, there was a change in his life and it came because he, he experienced the love of God through Christians. And he said, man, maybe there is a merciful God. Maybe there is a loving God out there. It's a beautiful story. You know, I don't think when he wrote that song that God was shocked and appalled and disgusted that he wrote a song called Why I Don't Believe in God. I think God was appalled and disgusted that his dad left him and walked out when he was a boy. We're invited to to speak freely about the pain that we go through and the hurt. You can start lifting your voice and telling God the truth about what you've been carrying. And Laura and I have been married for uh, 15 years last month. And sometimes, uh, like happens in relationships, like happens in couples, there'll be a little bit of distance that's created. And um, a few days will go by and with this distance is created. And, and usually the reason why there's some distance or some friction or some coldness in our relationship, it's usually because there's a truth that needs to be spoken that we're not saying and do you know when uh, intimacy is restored and when we kind of make up and things get back to normal? It's when one of us has the courage to say the hard thing that needs to be said. And all of a sudden, intimacy is restored, the, the, the gates come crashing down, and that, that distance that was there before was gone. Because I, I'll, I'll never forget this. It's going to be up on the screen, but this is something maybe you need to hear today. The shortest distance between two people is the truth. And this is true between you and uh, other humans, and this is also true between you and God. And I, and I don't know what hard truth you've been keeping on the inside that you need to bring to God, but I believe that when you have the courage to bring that hard truth to God, you're not gonna find shock or disgust. You're going to find the loving heavenly father who wants to wrap you in his arms and say, you're my child, I love you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for sharing that with me. You're invited to speak freely. So point one, there's gonna be trouble. Point two, you're invited to speak freely. And then the the last point as we close is, God is always working out the greatest possible good for everyone involved. But here's the kicker. We usually have a hard time seeing it. Did you know it's possible to be in the middle of a beautiful story of a plot line and you don't exactly see what's happening? In fact, I believe that if you are following Jesus today, you're in the middle of God's redemptive story. We just don't always see the beginning from the end. And so sometimes we, we miss it. Naomi had no idea what was going on. Yet she was right in the, middle, in the middle of God's beautiful redemptive story. We can see it today looking back at Naomi and Ruth's life, but Naomi had no idea Three different times, Naomi told Ruth, don't come back with me. No, don't, go back to your homeland. Ruth, uh, chapter uh, uh, one, verse 16, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Ruth clings to Naomi and this is such a beautiful, powerful declaration of faith. Have you, have you ever read this story and you're like, man, what was it that Boaz saw in Ruth that made Boaz fall in love with Ruth? That's what Boaz saw in her. <laughs> what is it about Ruth that she got her own chapter in the Bible and she's written into the genealogy, the story of our savior, Jesus. That's what God saw in her. It reminds me of that time where someone came to Jesus and Jesus said, wow, never in all of Israel have I seen this faith. And that's such a powerful Faith declaration. See, Naomi Naomi didn't even see the beautiful story that God was writing, but Ruth clings to her. The very last verse that we read when we started, if you know, you know, verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the what? The harvest. Do you know what happens in the harvest? She goes to glean at Boaz's field. There's a preacher joke about Boaz, but I'm not gonna say it. I don't wanna offend anyone today. And she falls in love with Boaz and he's the redeemer. Ruth begins with her entire life falling apart. And Ruth, just a couple short chapters later, it ends with a marriage and a new baby. 
Do you see the redemptive story that God is working? To Naomi, it felt like a lifetime of pain and suffering. She did not see the beginning from the end. She didn't know what God was working, but we get to see the beautiful redemptive arc, don't we? Can I tell you, friends, God is doing the same thing in your life. When your trust is in Jesus, he makes your path straight. God's redemptive story. He's the same God yesterday and today and forever. He weaves his redemptive story into our lives, but we don't always see it. So it's easy to lose heart. It's easy to get discouraged. It's hard to wait on the Lord. But we can, we can take heart when we look at Naomi's story, can't we? Say Ruth and Boaz had a baby and they named that baby Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse and Jesse had a son named King David. And that's how Ruth, this Moabite woman, not even a Jew, is put into the genealogy, the story of, of our Savior Jesus. As if to, the text is literally telling us, you and I would not be here today if it weren't for the unbelievable faith, that the day-to-day -day actions of working and eating and grieving and sleeping and spending time together, but the, their faith and their links in a chain that brought Jesus who is the savior for me and for you? It's a beautiful story. I love what Paul says. And Paul says, we know, we know that we know that God is working all things together for the good that lo for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you know that? Take heart even if you don't see the, the redemptive work, the way that God is working. Here's, here's the signature of God's work. The signature of God's work is that he uses the worst things to bring about the best outcomes. That's literally what the cross teaches us. The cross, the worst thing that could ever happen in the history of mankind. The murder of God's son, the brutal murder of God's son brought about redemption and new life and salvation for all who would believe call on his name. Do you see the beauty of the story? These two widows that cling to him, that show hope, that show what God can do in God's redemptive method. See, here's the beautiful story about life on planet earth. The moment that Adam and Eve left the garden, God has been redeeming earth one square inch at a time. And he's been using his people to redeem it. The problem is for many of us, it is a slow process. God has chosen his redemptive process to be slow. And so many of us, the suffering that we're currently in is because we're in a waiting season. We're waiting and it's not there yet. And the waiting is painful. Well, my mom is a beautiful, kind woman who would never hurt a fly. But if my mom walks into a restaurant, they tell her the wait is 50 minutes. <laughs> She's going somewhere else to eat. Waiting is so hard because we have an expectation that it's going to be short and easy. And so we enter into this waiting season and it feels like suffering and we're tempted to reach and subvert the waiting. But that's not trusting in God. That's trusting in our own understanding. But there's a, there's a maturation process that comes in that waiting when we cry out to God and we have this theology of lament, which says, God, I can bring it all to you. I can hold the pain. I can hold the waiting. I can hold the suffering and I can hold it up to you and I can still know that you're there and I can still know that your promises and I can still stand on your word. And in those moments, spiritual maturation comes to us, brothers and sisters. We become more like Jesus when we enter into suffering exactly what Paul said in one, for Colossians 1 24. Oh, I suffer for Jesus. I, I'm honored to do that. It shapes me more like our Savior. We're going to close in prayer, but I want to show you these two verses from Psalm 71 as we close. Psalm 71 verses 20 and 21, it says, you have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Will you bow your head and pray with me? If you would, right there in your lap, would you just open up your hands? We're going to say a prayer and in this prayer, you may want to follow along. God, you, you see us. We're gonna take what's in our hands, God, and we're gonna lift it up to you and, and, and symbolically saying, God, you know you know everything. Here is our life. 
here it is, all the beauty of it, God, and all the hurt of it, all the love of it and all the pain of it, all the questions, all the dreams, all the hopes, all the mess. And God, we're trusting that you are who you say that you are. Your spirit raised Jesus from the dead and by your spirit, you're writing your redemptive story in our lives and our family's life. So would you give us faith to believe? Would you give us faith to encourage us? Would you empower us by your Holy Spirit? Would you help us not to try and take matters into our own hands, but would you help us to cling to you and trust the story that you're writing? We ask this in Jesus' mighty name and everybody said, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, Next week is 80s week. So for 80s week, I encourage you to dress, act, and behave appropriately for the 80s. We'll see you next time. Have a good week.